same algorithm type thing back when I was training in residency, alpha blocker didn't work, boom. And now we have this complicated surgical algorithm where you know, you have size of the prostate. If you have a large prostate, you're over four or five options. If you have an average size prostate, you've got like 10 options, smaller prostates even. And then if you're medically complicated, you have other. So really have come a long way. Goals of treatment, we really have to rem remember that we're trying to alleviate bothersome symptoms. 75% of the people that come to us for LUTs are coming because they're bothered and not because of one of the absolute indications for surgery. So we need to be able to alleviate their symptoms. We, we wanna do something that's not gonna have complications. And then we might consider doing an intervention because we're trying to prevent progression if somebody expresses an interest in that. Um, the selection of treatment is gonna be based these days on prostate size, the patient comorbidities, the patient's concerns for the various safety and efficacy um, uh, considerations, like retrograde ejaculation, or, or let's say an ejaculation as opposed to retrograde, uh, it's gonna depend on our skill and the available technology at our institution. Um, if we think of minimally invasive procedures, there are, going to, there are many procedures out there, and I think that we need to sort of develop a system for how we're going to evaluate those. And I think right now, one of the most important things that it is is to reduce complications. And from my perspective, it's getting, doing some sort of procedure without anesthesia. That is truly minimally invasive. And uh, I think as you'll see as we go through some of the newer procedures, some of them meet those and some of them don't. So I'm gonna just run through the various options. And um, you know, much of this, I think this audience knows. But currently, a transurethral resection of the prostate, I would argue, is still the gold standard. And I think that the, it can be used for, you know, prostate, you know, less than 80 gram. But I mean, if you're depending on your, your skill and if you're using bipolar technology, I think that that, that can go even higher. Um, the data on the bipolar uh, versus monopolar, on the short term, the, I think we all realize bipolar, less bleeding no TUR syndrome, those are, the, those are the two biggest complications that people talk about with the TERP and motivated people to develop other forms of therapy. Um, they are similar in efficacy rates at, at 60 months. Transurethral incision of the prostate, still a viable option for somebody with a prostate that is very small. Um, that doesn't include our patient today. So we have the resection, and then we have now some enucleation technologies. And I, uh, if we look at nucleation simple prostatectomy, whether it's done open, robotic assisted, or uh, pure lap, uh, is a, um, <clears throat> a good option for patients with very large to very large prostates. Um, competing with the open prostatectomy, I think now, is laser nucleation of the prostate, whether it's whole lip, through lip, there's even, and, and some other ones, that I think uh, they are really size independent uh, options. The key to these is whether the, whether the surgeon has a skill. There is a learning curve to these, and uh, I think that's one of the things that's prevented them from catching on, especially in the United States. Um, we just recently started doing them at UCSD, and I think you have to look at 20, 25 surgeries before, you know, they, at least that's what the literature would suggest. I myself, I don't do them. Does anybody in here do them? Holops or thulips? Yeah. So it, 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 the, the data is really quite good for them, but again, it is a, a learning curve. Um, and, and you can do a bipolar enucleation. And this is just, uh, if you compare holop, uh, if you compare the um, enucleation procedures with lasers to open prostatectomy, um, they are similar in efficacy, probably better perioperative safety, especially with bleeding. If you compare them to TERP and mid-sized glands, again, similar mid to long-term efficacy. They do have longer operative times. They are probably more expensive, uh, but they do have a better safety profile when it comes to the bleeding. And they actually should be considered as treatment options for patients that are at high risk for bleeding or you can't take off anticoagulation. So we have vaporization procedures. Again, one of these, uh, it, it, you know, uh, at first it was going to be the thing that you know took Terp out of the out of business. 
I think we've had many different uh, platforms that we've used. We started at 80, then 120. The current sort of uh, a wavelength is 180. And there's good data uh, for a good randomized controlled trial that shows that vaporization of the prostate is effective in, in mid-sized prostates. It's similar efficacy, short and midterm. If you look at all the data for lasers, they do have a, lot, a higher long-term reintervention rates, probably related to not taking out away as much tissue. They're more hemostatic. It takes longer. Uh, there are higher costs. Um, but again, probably the procedure one would look at if you want, needed to keep them on anticoagulation. So now let's talk about the minimally uh, invasive procedures. So we have the prostatic urethral lift. That is uh, taking these staples. Uh, I think this is the most rapidly growing procedure in the, in the US for uh, BPH. It's indicated for patients currently 30 to 80 cc's and a verified absence of, a, of an obstructive middle lobe. Now, people are using them for middle lobes, uh, and there is some data uh, uh, that, that demonstrates that they uh, can be uh, used. That just came out with uh, Ruxtalsis, uh, just recently published that data. There's definitely uh, data su suggesting that this, they preserve erectile function and ejaculatory function. There are two randomized controlled trials that most of the data comes from. Uh, one is against sham, one is against TERP. Uh, against TERP, I think that the typical things that we would measure success by, which include IPSS score, flow rate, uh, and reintervention, they are not as effective. Um, however, it's interesting that the sim similar quality of life improvements uh, at two years. The, um, the data that, uh, the, on the best trials is the reintervention rates of 11% versus 6% for TERP and, or 13% uh, after five years. Now the one thing I would say about all of our trials that we need to, especially for minimally invasive procedures is, these are really developed um, maybe not to compete with TERP, maybe they're developed to compete with medication. But we, we need to look at that and we need to then start saying how many of these patients got off their medication. Because if they're not off their medication, then they're really, they haven't um, really succeeded. We have water vapor thermal therapy. Uh, so patients, again, indicated for patients with prostates between 30 to 80 cc's. There is now some data coming with prostates that are slightly larger, and I know that people you know, do them for that. Um, they definitely have good data for preservation of erectile and ejaculatory function. They have five-year data now just showing sustained changes uh, in IPSS and QMAX and preservation of ejaculatory function. We do not have any randomized trials of um, water-based thermal therapy against some of the standard procedures or some of the other minimally invasive procedures. So those will be yet, those will be something to look forward to. We have robotic water jet treatment, which is a robotic, a truly robotic uh, system uh, of uh, basically destroying prostate tissue under ultrasound guidance. We have the WATER trial and the WATER2 trial. The wa first trial was done uh, with randomization against TERP. The second was done with, with uh, a prospective trial of looking at larger prostates. And in both of these trials, this therapy has demonstrated uh, efficacy and safety. Its biggest problems are bleeding, especially in the larger prostates. And they've, they've now sort of gone over to recommending that you take a bipolar or a, 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 um, and do some cauterization at the bladder neck after the procedure, because there is no hemostatic uh, ability that's built into the system. Uh, the other issue is going to be um, that uh, we, the word's not quite out yet in terms of randomizing against like a holup or one of the other procedures that would do larger prostates. However, I would say that if this does have, if it does have efficacy with larger prostates, this is going to be one of those um, maybe game changer uh, procedures. Additional procedures that we'll just mention is microwave uh, therapy is still rec as a conditional recommendation. And PAE, both the European Association and the uh, AUA has decided uh, at this point in time there's not enough data to really recommend it. We use it in patients that are non-operative 
and are having you know large prostates. Um, but the one complaint that we always have, and I just had the patient in house now after a PAE, and whose service do they go to? They go directly to our service. The, radi the, the radiologists have no interest at all in seeing the patient in follow up. And so um, I think until they can really own a little bit more of their follow up, that's not going to really, really be uh, a catch on. So investigational, there are the night and all struts that, that there's data out there. Uh, and a, a little stint that goes in for temporarily to, uh, um, to open up the bladder neck. So in conclusion, I think we've gone a long way from just symptoms, failed medicine, terpum. We now have a very sophisticated method. I think in our patient today, who's got no real, he's got a medium-sized prostate, uh, he's got mild to moderate symptoms, um, this patient really lives right in this area right here, and I think the biggest determining factor is going to be um, a conversation with the patient about their side, what side effects they're willing to put up with, um, the availability of the technology at your institution, and your skill level. And I think that um, there, but there is something uh, for that patient. Thank you.